Dennis Kwok, direct from Hong Kong. Very good to be with you, sir. Thank you for having me. So one start off uh, is that we have this new national security law uh, that Beijing is essentially forcing Hong Kong to adopt. Uh, you said the following. This is the end of Hong Kong. This is the end of one country, two system. Make no mistake about it, that Beijing, the central people's government, has completely breached its promise to the Hong Kong people. So as one of Hong Kong's most vocal pro-democracy leaders, I have to ask you, if this is the end of Hong Kong, then what's, what's your next move? That's a very good question. Um, I think the international community needs to see what is happening to Hong Kong uh, and what is supposed to be a 50-year guarantee of a high degree of autonomy has come to an end only after just 23 years. Um, uh, the Hong Kong people was promised democracy. We still don't have democracy. Um, we were promised our freedom, and now they're trying to take away our freedom by directly legislating for this national security law and imposing it directly on Hong Kong, bypassing all our institutions, all our process, uh, which is not supposed to happen, but it's happening right before our eyes. And the world needs to know and needs to watch very carefully. Why do you think it's happening? I think it's uh, part of this uh, strategy by the People's Republic of China in trying to assert uh, itself onto uh, people uh, within the country. And also you can see that, um, you know, they are doing the same so-called wolf warrior di diplomacy around the world, uh, asserting themselves everywhere. For Western viewers that aren't familiar with how Hong Kong and how your government in particular operates, can you explain why certain members of Hong Kong's leadership, like the chief executive, Carrie Lam, would be putting Beijing's interest before Hong Kong's? Because she got her job because of Beijing. Uh, she got her job uh, because uh, Beijing appointed her. And uh, her job depends on Beijing's uh, continued support. And I think it's become very clear that this Hong Kong government, this administration is nothing but a puppet of uh, the uh, Central People's Government. Uh, and the so-called high degree of autonomy um, doesn't uh, apply anymore. Now, you've been quite outspoken. Uh, you're a member of Hong Kong's Legislative Council, and, and you've drawn the ire both of Beijing and of the chief executive of Hong Kong on more than one occasion. Uh, one headline I could cite were your efforts to block the passage of certain laws, including a bill that would criminalize disrespecting the Chinese national anthem led to an all-out brawl on the legislative floor. Uh, explain to our viewers uh, how that happened, what happened. I, uh, let me be clear. I was uh, simply presiding over uh, a meeting of uh, the House Committee, which is one of the most important uh, committees in the Legislative Council. And uh, I was holding the meeting strictly in accordance with the rules of procedure of uh, the Legislative Council. But uh, Beijing accused me of um, filibustering. They accused me of misconduct in public office and also have breached my uh, oath when I took office. Uh, all these um, allegations came to a knot. Um, ultimately, they resolved it by uh, taking away my uh, power to continue to preside over the meetings as chairman. And when we are going through COVID-19, uh, when we have gone through a whole year of political unrest and facing a possible economic recession, I would have thought that the Hong Kong government should focus on things like how to get the economy going or how to uh, reduce unemployment or how to um, help uh, Hong Kong generate more businesses, etc. But instead of focusing on those important issues, the first thing they want to do is to pass a national anthem law. Uh, criminalizing people who show disrespect to the national anthem. Clearly, the agenda is now being set by Beijing, and the Hong Kong government puts Beijing agenda ahead of everything else. And this is what's happening. Do you talk with any of these guys socially? Uh, do we, I mean, the, the pro-Beijing legislators, you're obviously there in the same group. Um, uh, and not, not so much these days, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we used to have a better communication, but um, unfortunately, uh, because of the events of the past 12 months, I don't think there is a constructive dialogue going on 
uh, within the Legislative Council. So there are literally there there are no legislators you talk to um, on, on the on the pro mainland side. I wouldn't go as far as that, but um, there are obviously people I've known for years. But um, it is I, what I find is that um, even though privately they might agree with uh, the unreasonable uh, uh, move by Beijing and by uh, the Hong Kong government. Uh, outwardly, they are afraid to take that position because of uh, they are afraid of um, redress from uh, uh, the People's Republic of China. I'm asking just because, I mean, it's always good in these environments to get some back channel. And again, as you say, you are dealing with coronavirus, in fact, quite successfully in the context of the rest of the world. Um, wh what do they say to you um, about what the agenda is, what the priorities now are, both in terms of this um, national anthem piece of legislation, as well as the new national security law that's coming down from Beijing? The agenda is to um, um, follow Beijing's uh, instruction to pass these laws so that um, they feel they could assert uh, their will on the Hong Kong people. And the ironic thing is, um, you mentioned COVID-19. In fact, Hong Kong has um, handled COVID-19 relatively well, as you said, but also um, as the community, we were uh, breaking off from uh, some of the worst protests that we saw last year, that some of the um, you know, uh, protests were, uh, were, were cooling off and, and people were staying home because of COVID-19. And you will remember last year, what started the protest was when they tried to pass that extradition bill, which which would allow Hong Kong citizens to be sent to China for trial. And that was what started it. And instead of learning from that lesson, they are uh, doing exactly the same thing, but this time even more draconian, uh, which is to pass the national security law in Beijing and impose it on Hong Kong. Let, let's talk about what China is doing right now on the ground in Hong Kong. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a pretty assertive PR campaign um, with local business people, with their own legislators, um, I mean, door-to-door -door canvassers trying to get support. Um, is it working? Well, a new poll just came out uh, showing that 64% of the population are against this national security law. And I expect as the details uh, rolled out, uh, more and more people would be uh, against this law. Now, the, the important thing to remember, Ian, is that we don't even have the details of the uh, this legislative proposal. We don't even know what's going to be in there. You know, there are some big uh, uh, headings put out by Beijing, uh, subversion, sedition, secession, foreign interference. And foreign interference is the one that I'm most concerned about because what does it mean uh, when they try to outlaw foreign interference in Hong Kong? Hong Kong is an international city. The fact that we are having this conversation is uh, a sign of this uh, uh, you know, international uniqueness uh, of Hong Kong's nature. Now, is this conversation going to be illegal going forward after they pass this law? It will be a very sad day for Hong Kong if all international uh, engagement and activities have to stop because they are so-called foreign interference. There's been a lot of talk in the United States. If this is the end of autonomy and end of one country, two systems, then we should end the special trade status that we afford Hong Kong. Uh, are you saying we should really wait to make that decision until we understand what's in the legislation, that you want to see pressure against Beijing right now, but not necessarily concretely what the responses are until we know what it is? Um, it's a very painful question for, for those of us who love Hong Kong. On the one hand, we want Hong Kong to be this international financial trading hub, uh, this great city where there's freedom and liberty under uh, one country, two systems. But if Beijing, I've already warned two years ago, I've been traveling to the United yes. States quite a lot, and I have been telling my friends back home and also to the Hong Kong government, if you continue down this path, of eroding one country, two systems, one day, and that day may come very soon, in which we will lose the trading privilege. But guess what? They don't care. Do you think it is more effective 
for the Americans to end it now, the special trade status, or threaten the, the Chinese government that they will, depending on this legislation? All I'm saying is that if they really are going to end the trading status uh, because of what's happening, I... This is the natural consequences of uh, China's actions, and I would not blame them. Is Hong Kong just not economically important enough? Is that is that a lot of what's happening here? And so, you know, Beijing no longer feels like it matters. They can take the hit? I think I would disagree with that, Ian, um, because if you look at uh, foreign direct investment, 70% of FDI that goes into China goes, goes through, through Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah. And also, Hong Kong is w- one of the top uh, equity financing center in the world. Uh, it beats uh, sometimes London and New York. And um, when your Congress and uh, uh, your uh, president is threatening to push back on Chinese listed companies away from America, uh, where does these Chinese company go? They go back to Hong Kong because Hong Kong is the best way in which for them to relist and to uh, continue to attract international capital markets. Is this the time to cut off Hong Kong? as their only true international financial uh, center in China, I think it would be foolish for anyone to uh, make that assumption. Um, What do you think the mood is like for the people today? And why are we not seeing much larger mass protest? Well, partly it's because they're using the social distancing rules uh, because of COVID-19 to uh, stop people from coming out. Now, last week, um, one day alone, they arrested more than, I think, 500 people in different parts of Hong Kong because people were trying to gather to protest against the national anthem law and the police were unhinged. Uh, They were shooting at people uh, with uh, pepper guns, uh, randomly arresting. Even school kids were uh, seen taken uh, up, uh, arrested and uh, brought up to the the police car. Um, So they, they are really pressing hard. I mean, here in the United States, of course, we have lots of protests in the middle of a pandemic. Um, How much concern do you have that uh, Hong Kong will no longer be such a success story on the COVID side uh, because this is happening now? And, and, you know, if you're getting hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets as they're changing the character of your territory, um, a pandemic is not the best time to do that. Correct, Ian. Um, I think the uh, Hong Kong people has has been very vigilant. You know, we started wearing masks uh, in January, even before the government tell us uh, that we have to wear masks, uh, because they were saying uh, at the time that there's no need to wear masks because they don't like people wearing masks in mass protests. But the Hong Kong people just don't trust them and went out to get masks on their own. Um, And I think even if um, the Hong Kong people cannot gather physically together, I think there will be other activities, other ways in which um, they will try to show their dissent. Now, there's a very important election coming up in September. Uh, The Hong Kong people will not forget any of this. Now, okay, fine. Some people say, well, they will cancel the election in September. Well, let them do that. Let the world see how ugly they can get. But the Hong Kong people will not give up. Um, Have you had any reason thus far to be concerned about your personal safety? Well, um, you know, all of uh, uh, my colleagues on the Democratic side are concerned about their personal safety. Well, uh, my colleagues, some of them have been beaten up by thugs. Some of them have been followed and beaten up. Uh, Some of them have been charged and prosecuted for, uh, you know, for what they do in the Legislative Council. And so they are coming after us hard and fast. So, Dennis, I mean, this this is a very challenging time in the world, and it's a very challenging time in Hong Kong. Um, when you look at the next months and what's ahead of you, what what's giving you hope right now? What's driving you forward? The Hong Kong people. Um, you know, when I walk down the street, uh, you know, a lot of people would, you know, give me the thumbs up. Uh, they would say, Ka yao, and, um, you know, we're getting a lot of messages of support. Um, and, uh, the Hong Kong people is not giving up. And if they don't give up as their representative, we must soldier on. And although there's not a clear pathway out uh, at the moment, but I think we just have to keep buggering on using Churchill's uh, famous phrase, we cannot give up. Dennis Kwok, Godspeed. Good to talk to you. 
Good talking to you, Ian. Thank you.